Hi, everyone. It's Virginia Stanley, Chris Connolly, and Lainey Mays, and we're here with a very special episode of Door to Door with our author, Elizabeth Wetmore, who's written the most amazing book, Valentine, which we will go get to in a minute. But first, I wanted to go around our little square here and everybody sort of chime in and say your hellos. Chris? Oh, hello. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I am Chris Connolly. I had to check to make sure I wasn't on mute, just getting used to the whole Zoom thing still. Um, and yeah, I am so excited to be joined by Elizabeth Wetmore, who continues to blow us away both with her book and with her talks. We'll get into that in a little later, but we're really excited. And again, thanks, Elizabeth, for joining us. Hi, I hope everybody's holding up well wherever they are being held up. Um, and we're so excited that you're here, and I'm really excited to talk about Valentine. Well, we have been fans of this book since, since we read it. It feels like forever ago. It feels like an old friend. Uh, and we are not the only fans. Uh, this is a, uh, has been chosen as a Read with Jenna uh, a book club on the Today Show. And huge raves from everyone from Ann Patchett. We have a beautiful quote from Ann Patchett who says, uh, fierce and complex, Valentine is a novel of moral urgency and breathtaking prose. This is the very definition of a stunning debut. Star reviews from, uh, from uh, Book Page and from Publishers Weekly uh, and many other uh, wonderful raves. They just keep coming in. I love this one from the Washington Post. And this Elizabeth Gilbert is just unbelievable as well. It's just so, so, so everything right there, because they do stay with you. Um, from the Washington Post, Valentine is a story about how women, particularly women without much education or money, negotiate a culture of masculine brutality. This is the story of their lives in a backwater oil town in 1970s, which Wetmore seems to know with empathy so deep it aches. Elizabeth. Welcome to Library Love Fest's program, Door to Door, where we are reaching librarians and patrons via Zoom. And we are so, so thrilled to have you with us today. So thank you so much. for. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Hi, everyone. So I'm so delighted. And I, I also really love that, um, that line from the Washington Post. I, it's, that was one that I think will probably stick with me forever. So yeah, yeah. That's great. That's pretty powerful stuff. Um, so many people have, have read your book, uh, already you've been to the American Library Association. You've been so supportive of libraries with, uh, everything that you've done, including this right now, but, uh, I'd love you to sort of give us, uh, you know, a little bit of a framework for the book, if you would. Okay. Um, so Valentine is um, a book um, that begins in the immediate aftermath of a vicious assault on a 14-year-old Mexican-American girl, um, and it chronicles the, the effect this crime has on her and her family, as well as um, five other women and girls um, who live in the Permian Basin, Midland, Odessa. Um, Odessa is my hometown, so it was familiar terrain for me. Um, and uh, so alternating points of view from um, six different women and girls. So, and uh, it sort of follows uh, the immediate aftermath of the crime up through um, the trial of the young man who um, is guilty. And, um, and so that's, that's the book. Uh, as I said before, we were, we we're all such big fans of this book, Lainey in particular, embrace this book. I don't know, Lainey, how many times did you read Valentine? Oh, two all the way through. <laughs> and then several times. I'm very proud to say that we had paper copies, you know, before we had a cover. And so, which we'll talk about the podcast episode we did with you and your editor, Emily, which was so great. Um, but we, before we did that, I like marked it up and I still have it on my desk. It's got like all <laughs> these, things pointing different ways and, and pencil markings everywhere. And that that's a very rare, rare thing um, to even read it twice, but to have all of that. And it's it's so nice to look at. And and remember the first time I got to read it because it's, it's taken up space in my heart and won't leave, you know? It's, 
it's been, it was such a special read and I don't, I don't forget it. You won't forget about it ever, but it just stays with you so much. And I think the characters are just so arresting and uh, Virginia and I both came into work separately and said, you know, like, oh, I just get these vibes of Flannery O'Connor, which I do not use lightly. I love her. <laughs> and um, we both said it separately. And so you just get these these characters and like the grit that's in there. I, I feel like, you know, you don't, nothing's perfectly manicured. You like get to see like, dirt under their fingernails. That's how close you get to them because you know that they've clawed out of some things, you know? And it it's one of my favorite reads. So thank you for writing. And I say that every time I see you, <laughs> but it's so true. Thank you. That's incredibly kind. Thank you. Yeah, you know, all of these women and girls were really familiar to me. Um, you know, I am, I grew up there and um, just by, just by virtue of where I grew up and when I grew up in 1976, I was about the same age as Deborah Ann Pierce, one of the, the characters in the book. And um you know, it just, just by, just by, you know, hook and by crook, it was a, it was a street full of women and girls. There weren't a lot of little boys on the street. There were tons of daughters and this was, you know, this was the oil patch in the seventies. So, you know, the men who lived on the street were up and out. And so much of my childhood, I found myself surrounded by women and girls of all ages. And um, I spent a good deal of my childhood sitting on the back porch with my mom and her girlfriends and neighbors, you know, after supper while they, you know, had their mixed drinks and their cigarettes and talked about, you know, their lives. And I think those, um, for me, when the book began, it really began with those voices more than anything else. Um, so yeah. I'm glad that they're, I'm glad that they've touched your heart because they have touched my heart my whole life. So it's an honor to, to be able to, you know, um, to bring those voices into, into the world. We've talked about on the podcast that it was so important to be told all from women's perspectives because you had an earlier version with a man's version and it, it you took it out because it's so important to have all women. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I actually, I did. I had a few, I had a few, um, I, I had drafts where I had um, four men's voices actually, um, four chapters from the points of view of men and they sort of draft by draft, they sort of gradually fell out. Um, the good news is I got some lovely short stories out of them. Um, you know, initially I think I, I thought that because of the time and place, um, it would be impossible to tell this story without men's voices, um, in part because the, you know, even today, the petroleum industry and especially the sort of blue collar part of the, the petroleum industry is, is really dominated by men. There aren't many women who work as roughnecks. And back in the seventies, there were even fewer. And, and it was important to me, um, you know, to, to really, to really grapple with the town economy um, in part, yeah, I think, I don't know, maybe it was like Eudora Welty or someone, I'm probably stealing this from someone else, but who basically said she was suspicious of characters who weren't concerned with the facts of blood and money, you know, and um, and that's really true for me. I'm, I'm always interested in what work my characters are doing. And because in Odessa, it's so singular, you know, I, I really believed that, um, that it would be impossible to tell the stories without those male voices. And so one by one, they sort of gradually fell out. Um, and actually I can thank Emily, my editor, for getting that final voice out of there because she came back to me when we were editing and she said, you know, I just, I'm so, you know, the women and girls are enough. And then of course, you know, as that happened through that process, I, I came to realize that not only were the women and girls voices enough, but that they deserved for this book to be theirs, you know? Um, so while I, there are men in the book, they don't get a point of view. Um, and, uh, and the stories really are, you know, about the women and girls, so. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's, that's, that's very interesting, that approach that you're taking. And I thought, I think it's very interesting when you talk about readers who've reached out to you, like you were just telling us about the woman who just said how you you nailed it because you 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 just have captured it so authentically? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm the, 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 there's a lot that's really fun about your book coming out. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things that's been most fun has been getting letters from people, um, notes um, via Instagram or, or my website from people um, who, who are enjoying the book and, and who um, are finding it meaningful. And that's, you know, I mean, that's the most gratifying thing you know, other than sitting alone in your room and actually doing the writing, which is magic and nothing is better than that ever, you know? Um, but the, the second best thing are, are people reaching out to me. And in particular, it's been really gratifying to hear from women who know that part of the world um, or who are still living there, um, who have said that, you know, um, this was very familiar to them and, and meaningful to them. And my favorite so far is like this really, really short little email um, uh, that basically said, you know, I live there now, you nailed it. <laughs> so that's good, you know? So, I mean, also there's just, I, I'm glad I got it right. I mean, right, cause you, you know, want, always want to get it right, so. Absolutely. Yeah. I think a lot of the time you're kind of a, a slave to your own, your own lenses, which works well to talk about this book, because that's a lot of the, the main point that these women, mm -hmm. um, especially the white women in town have their own glasses that they're seeing the world in. But when you're writing stuff, you're, you can only say what you felt and saw. And so it's nice to hear from other people that they felt the same way. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it took me a long time to write this book, you know, um, about 30 years after leaving home, you know, um, and I think a big part of that was for a long time, my own lenses were um, made it impossible for me to um, see these characters' lives clearly and in ways that were nuanced enough to both be honest and true, um, but also um, empathetic, I guess. And, you know, and you're right. I mean, you know, Mary Rose Whitehead, who's one of the heroes of the book, you know, um, she's in spite of doing remarkable things, you know, even, even as the book ends, she's still really unable to see Glory Ramirez through, you know, a lens um, that accords Glory, you know, sort of, um, you know, the kind of dignity and individuality that she deserves. She can only, there's, there's a moment late in the book where she says this could have happened to any of our girls, right? Mm -hmm. And when she says our girls, she means, you know, white girls, right? And so, so all of these characters are, you know, um, terribly flawed, you know, and, and, um, and that's good because that's true, you know, and at the same time, you know, we are all, um, you know, we're all heroes, right? I mean, we all have the ability to sort of step up to the plate when the time comes, regardless of who we are, or where we're from, or what our story is, or even if we've been, you know, on the wrong side of things, um, and and act in ways that are heroic. So um, my Nana used to say that until they carry you out the back door in the pine box, there's always time. <laughs> and I love that, you know, That's I mean, great. you're not... You know, our stories aren't over ever, you know, and, and I think about that a lot, you know, because I think a lot of people feel like their lives aren't, don't lend themselves to acts of heroism, you know, and, um, and they do. So, yeah, that's beautiful. That's, that's lovely. And so true. It's not over till it's over. Um, Chris, do you want to talk about, um, hc.com and how people can what's available there yeah sure so and i did post a link so yeah absolutely so anyone who's watching you should see in our comment section on facebook uh that there is a link it says purchase your own copy of valentine here and it links to harpercollins.com and all the formats are available so you can order a physical copy but the ebook is available the digital audio uh, which is fantastic and i know there's going to be a lot of fans eager to listen to this special novel um, and then also there's a link to laney's incredible podcast episode with elizabeth and her editor um, and there's also a reading guide and i should definitely show you all what that looks like because it's fantastic uh, let's see here reading guide the most beautiful reading guide i've ever seen it's Seriously, fabulous right? yeah. here it's i'm going to share my screen with everyone so you can see what i'm looking yeah. at yeah. Uh, let's see here. All right. So is everyone seeing that okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Beautiful. Make it nice and big. So 
discussion questions. And boy, is there a lot to discuss here. The Odessa salty dog, very important. Definitely something after the library left us team's own heart is a good French <laughs> recipe. I think we need to freeze that for one second, Chris. Sure. Because I would love Elizabeth to talk about two things here before we mm -hmm. hop off to do a, for Elizabeth to do a reading of the yes. book for us. I love this, this excerpt right here. I, I was saying to Lainey before, reading these four sentences makes me want to read this book all over again. I mean, it is, it's absolutely beautiful. It is so, it is so atmospheric. It's, it's just so, uh, it just, it's, it's captivating really. Um, and I, I love that. Um, uh, Elizabeth, can you see that? I can. Yeah. Can you read those four sentences for me. Sure. Um, yeah, I love these four sentences too. And this chapter um, happens in the wake of a, a pretty horrific day for for you know Mary Rose Whitehead and and I love the way that you know women take care of each other you know regardless of um, or can take care of each other. Um, so anyway, here's the here's the um, excerpt. It says. Um, <clears throat> At dusk, Corinne walks across the street and we settle in with a full pack of cigarettes and a bottle of vodka. I make a pitcher of salty dogs and Corinne grabs an ashtray. We turn out the porch light and leave the patio door cracked open, sit out in the backyard under the darkening sky. Tonight, it is tinged purple, a sign that there might be a dust storm coming our way. What more? <laughs> It's just poetic. It's just beautiful. Um, you. Also, the Odessa Salty Dog sounds pretty tasty right about now. It is in the like middle to? of a hot Texas summer. It is uh, delicious. <laughs> 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 so, well, yeah, this is this is this is wonderful and and full of great uh, things. Uh, so, and you can, as Chris said, you can. Um, you can download, you can, you know, buy the, uh, the ebook, the audio, the physical, all formats are there, but there are also all those wonderful assets. And of course, um, in addition to the audio excerpt, there's your interview with Lainey and your editor, which is really great. That's so great. we're so glad. Yeah. Um, I would love to uh, have you read from Valentine right now, okay. if you would be willing to do that. I will. So, um, whoops, I'm sorry, I have to move my coffee, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so this is, a, this is a late chapter and uh, the title of this chapter is Carla. Um, and, uh, and I'm just gonna read a little bit at the very beginning of the chapter. So I'm gonna move my keyboard. Okay, so this is Carla's chapter. <clears throat> we lose the men when they try to beat the train and their pickup truck stall on the tracks or they get drunk and accidentally shoot themselves, or they get drunk and climb the water tower and fall 10 stories to their deaths. During cutting season, when they stumble in the chute and a bull calf roars and kicks them in the heart, on fishing trips when they drown in the lake or fall asleep at the wheel on the drive home, pile up on the interstate, shooting at the Dixie Motel, hydrogen sulfide leak outside Gardendale, Looks like somebody came down with a fatal case of the stupid, Evelyn says when one of the regulars shares the news at happy hour. Those are the usual ways, the ordinary days, but now it is the first of September and the bone spring shale is coming back into play. Now we will also lose them to crystal and coke and painkillers. We will lose them to slipped drill bits or unsecured stacks of pipeline or fires caused by vapor clouds. And the women, how do we lose them? Usually, it's when one of the men kills them. In the spring of 1962, just after natural gas fields were discovered out near Wink, Evelyn likes to tell new hires, one of her waitresses clocked out, rolled up her apron, and carried it with her into the bar to knock back a few with the regulars. The woman's car was still in the parking lot when Evelyn locked up that night, and it sat there for nearly a week before they found her body. At an abandoned oil lease, Evelyn says, because that's where you always find the bodies. Bastard set her on fire too. 
You don't get used to knowing something like that. Evelyn is small and wound tight with four arms like sisal and a beehive the color of ripe plums. The next gas fields will be even bigger than wink, she tells us at the weekly staff meetings. Start your engines, gals. Get ready to make bank. Keep your eyes peeled for the next serial killer. Uh, um, wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, Dodie Owens, uh, someone on Facebook said, oh my God, favorite part of the whole book. <laughs> I love that chapter. I love Carla's chapter a lot, actually. I waited tables for 12 years. So I just in general, I feel really comfortable setting a chapter in a restaurant among wait staff. So, you know, yeah, it's, I, I really love that chapter. Yeah. Well, Jody owns is, is she's with the Denver, the Denver Public Library, and she's a huge fan. She was so excited when she found out that you were going to be on. So, yeah. oh, so glad that, that yeah. She's, she's she said, um, Chris, who else is out there? She also somewhere. said that I, she gave her galley to a favorite customer at the Denver Public Library who grew up in Oklahoma. Mm. And when he came back a couple of days later, he just said, wow, she nailed it. This book's going to win awards. And I totally agree. Aww. Well, thank you for being a librarian. When I was in college, I was on the fence between being an English major um, or a librarian or a forest ranger. So English major won out, but man, it was a really, it was neck and neck there for a while. So yeah, so thanks for working as a librarian. So that's, uh, that's, that's some of the most important work that goes on. So especially now, I think probably when I have a lot of friends who are working at home as librarians and still trying to help people out and make sure that people are able to get books, you know, electronically or, you know, doing whatever they can to help people, you know, sort of wind their way through all of this. So, so thank you. I know you've said, um, even on the podcast, uh, but you said that the bookmobile was really important to you. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, I, I was talking about people um, earlier who who've sent me notes and a couple of women I actually knew growing up have sent me um, notes saying that in particular, they were really touched by the bookmobile. Um, and they remembered it, you know, they remembered that swamp cooler and that kind of smelly shag carpet. And, you know, for those of you who are, you know, too young or from places where, you know, bookmobiles weren't necessary, the, the bookmobile in my hometown was an enormous sort of trailer that was sort of pulled in by an 18 wheeler and sort of set up on a parking lot um, very close to the street where I grew up and and for girls like me who love to read I mean it basically meant that instead of waiting for my parents to have a moment to take me downtown to the one library in downtown Odessa that you know I could bike up there and go myself and um, I spent a lot of really happy hours sort of hanging around the swamp cooler and laying on the carpet and listening to people come and go and um and also the two amazing women who ran the thing who i realize now were volunteers from austin and um and who seemed to me like the most sophisticated um women in the world you know when i was a girl now i look back on it and i realize that they were like 22 year old college students, you know, but, but then, I mean, I, I remember them so clearly and I remember thinking, you know, this is, this is what it means to, you know, grow up and sort of, you know, be someone, you know, from the city and be doing good work, you know, so, and of course I, in my, as a kid, I think I probably imagined that they were making like real money doing this, which of course they probably weren't actually making anything. So yeah, yeah, the bookmobile is, it meant a lot to me. It was a real lifesaver actually, you know, I, it's hard for me to imagine what, um, what my life would have been like or how it might have gone differently without having access to those books because among other things I mean uh, you know escape <laughs> um, but uh, but among other things you know it was my first window into the idea that the whole world wasn't the world I saw right in front of me you know um, and that there were different places to be and different ways of being you know um, and that really meant the world to me yeah yeah, you learn to be more empathetic and put yourself in other people's shoes because you can read more about them. Mm -hmm. Well, and and dream bigger too, right? I mean, you know, I think I think um, 
you know, for a, a lot of people, I mean, that I, you know, depending on where you come from, I mean, I think it can be really tempting to believe that the, the path that, that is, is open to you, you know, is a, is a pretty narrow one, you know, so, so it definitely allowed me to, to dream big. And also it made me fall in love with how beautiful words are, you know, I, I mean, I, I remember just sitting there and sort of quietly whispering words to myself, you know, and sentences and, you know, so there's a part in the book where I took a couple of little lines from um, Charlotte's Web, which was probably the first book I, it was the first book I remember loving so deeply that I would go back and just reread passages over and over and over again, you know, so anyway. I love that. Nice Love job. There we go. Um, <laughs> I just want to pass along some comments. We had, again, librarians reading this book, you know, uh, almost a year in advance. who loved it so much, including Kimberly McGee, who's with Lake Travis Community Library in Texas. I think you probably I know Lake Travis. Right. Yes. Yeah, um, and she, again, loved your book, just commented our book mobile, while smaller than your old one and doesn't smell, but it is well loved. So <laughs> they... <laughs> Um, and then Evelyn Hershkowitz says, as a librarian, we are trying our best to work from home and get books to our patrons, especially through the digital mode. So thank you for visiting like this online. Um, Jennifer Winberry with Hunterton in New Jersey said, we still have a bookmobile and people love it. Our carpet does not smell. That seems to be a theme. And again, she's <laughs> someone who loved your book as well. She's been such an avid supporter. And then uh, Carol Fitzgerald, who runs the book reporter, a good friend of ours, and she said, loved meeting you. Um, I think at ALA Midwinter, great to talk. So, and there's just so many comments of love and excitement to read this book. So again, people appreciate you we being here. We have a question. Yeah. I can um, probably shag carpet in Texas in August <laughs> with a swamp cooler. I think that there's probably no smell in the world that could ever <laughs> sort of even come close to, you know, matching that. So yeah, I'm not surprised everyone else's carpet smells fine. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a question from Jessica Bullock Pies who says, what books did you enjoy reading back in your bookmobile days? Oh man, you know, I was a voracious reader um, and, uh, and I was one of those kids who if I finished a book and I didn't have a new one, I would just like immediately flip back to page one and just start all over. Um, and I'm 52. So, um, so gosh, um, what, I, I mean, I would pretty much read anything that, came, that was put in front of me, but I remember specifically um, really loving Stephen King um, you know, Judy Bloom, um, Essie Hinton, um, of course, Charlotte's Web when I was a little younger, um, gosh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> um, I, I, my reading wasn't real directed, you know, um, although, again, there were definitely moments when librarians, you know, would put things in my hands and say, give this a shot, you know, and that also meant a lot to me. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of off the top of my head. Gosh, I feel like I'm probably forgetting someone so crucial to my reading that when this is all over, I will kick myself. But um, let's see. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I was one of those. I wasn't a great student. I was an avid reader, but I wasn't a great student. And so a lot of what was taught in my English classes did not, you know, um, do much for me. Um, so, yeah. And someone did ask, let's see here, um, Natalie Welch asked, did you go back to Odessa before or while you were writing the book? Yeah, I still have family there. Um, it's a family in Midland, actually. Um, my mom and dad retired a few years ago and went down to um, South Texas. Um, but I still have family there and I go as often as I'm able. Um, and, you know, because I left home at 18-ish, um, you know, and I'm writing this book, I was writing this book many years later, um, I would go home and spend a lot of time just driving around out in the oil patch, you know, um, and uh, just remembering, you know, the smells and um, the place and the, you know, the incredibly beautiful sky um, and the quiet, um, you know, Odessa is a part of a, you know, there are a lot of migratory birds that stop in, um, that, you know, in that area. So Sandhill Cranes, for example, um, so yeah, I, I go back as often as I can. 
I think I have one more question if you're willing to stick around a little longer. Um, yeah, for okay. as long as you want. All right. Um, and someone just asked, and I'm sorry if you touched on this, any authors that influenced your writing? Yes. Um, oh gosh, where to start? Oh man. Um, when I first started writing, um, there were, uh, you know, I, I really, really loved and still do really love the short story form. Um, so, um, you know, I was really influenced at the beginning of, of my writing life by people like um, Raymond Carver and Dennis Johnson, um, Alice Munro. Um, oh my God. Um, uh, you know, Flannery O'Connor, Shirley Jackson. I love Shirley Jackson, you know, um, Carson McCullers um, really was huge for me. Um, uh, oh gosh, um, boy, I feel like I'm forgetting really, really important people um, to who, meant, who have meant so much to me. Um, yeah, uh, um, I think like a lot of Southerners, you know, I, I went through a Faulkner phase and, you know, um, and uh, Catherine Ann Porter, you know, when I was thinking about, you know, Texas books. Um, when I was, I should have said this earlier, um, a, you know, a big, a big influence actually on me when I was very young, um, I, for a time I was really in love with Westerns. Um, so I loved the work of Larry McMurtry and um, Elmer Kelton um, and folks like that. And in fact, I just read True Grit for the first time, the Charles Portis book, which is beautiful. I recommend it to everyone. I can't believe it took me this long. Um, um, but uh, I really loved Westerns for a time when I was a girl. And then when I was a little older, there was a period of time when I really loved Cormac McCarthy. Um, and I think that really influenced my writing in the sense that I loved the genre, but I kept, I, but I, I realized in very short order that I rarely saw women and girls represented in those books in, in, in really meaningful and complicated ways, um, you know, and, uh, and I think that probably, um, has had a, a real impact on what I choose to write and how I choose to write it. So that's a good question. I feel like I should write some of these questions down and prepare myself <laughs> for like the next time. So these are all great questions. Thank you. I think what's great is that, you know, what springs to mind springs to mind. Mm -hmm. You right. know, I, you know, it's, right. it's like, I mean, we can all, you know, Oh, why didn't I say this or why I said, but you know mm -hmm. what? It's, I yeah. think it's the ones that are just there that come right to your mind when right. you think about what did influence your writing. What did you love when you were a kid? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the Charlotte's Web thing, you're killing me with that. You know, oh, I mean, yeah. I'll, right? bet you, I'll bet you if I had a copy of it right here, right now, I could open it to a particular page and read a passage aloud and move myself to tears like immediately because I was a pretty maudlin kid, actually. Like I was one of those kids who would put on the, you know, an album and play it over and over and over again and just sit there, you know, yeah. and weep, you know, and then I felt a lot better, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, I mean, I, I, yeah, there were people who were commenting saying, oh, it's my favorite Charlotte, you know, and, and mine too. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember, I think the first page, you know, her, her, their, her sneakers are wet and she's running through the, through the grass, you know, for, yeah. and it's just like, oh, geez, yeah. you know, what music do you like? Or what sort of music do you like? I'm curious. Oh gosh, you know, I I am I am the I am um I am the best kind of dilettante, which is to say, I love music across the board. Um, I'm really lucky. I have a 15 year old son who helps me to stay relevant, um, and that's nice. Um, but really, I like it all. Um, you know, punk, country. Um, when I was writing this book, I actually really fell in love with the outlaw country music you know scene um another scene that unfortunately did not have as many women as it should but you know jesse coulter and people like that um, i fell in love with chris christopherson who is a oh, wow. brilliant brilliant lyricist i i you know i i'm not sure that people always um give him his his due on the lyrics that he writes um let's see what else um did i say punk uh Let's see. Yeah. Um, right now, I'm listening to a lot of Ezra Furman, like a lot. And part of that is because he's on Instagram almost every day, 
um, singing beautiful songs um, to help cheer us all up and, and get us through our days. And it's really meant a lot to me. Um, who else am I listening to? My husband just won free tickets um, through a radio station. There's a lot I love about my husband. One of the things I love about him is that he um, he has a real knack for like winning free stuff by calling in. Like if you have to be the tenth caller, like he's really good at that. And so we went to see um, the Lumineers, which were great. Um, but the person who opened for them um, was uh, oh my gosh, J S Sondara. Do y'all know who I'm talking about? He's great. Um, so we saw that recently, um, actually really just before everything sort of, um, you know, happened with the, with the, um, with the uh, COVID-19 virus. So um, what else? Gosh, I love Johnny Cash um, as, as, as one must. Um, let's see here. Um, Patsy Cline, uh, Patty Griffin, Lucinda Williams, Emmy Lou Harris, um, um, Fiona Apple has a new album coming out like any minute now, and I can't wait. <laughs> I'm right there for it. Um, let's cool. see. Um, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's a probably that's cool. Good. Yeah. Are you a fan of Mary Chapin Carpenter? I am. I am. Yeah. She. I. I love her. I know we're getting off now, but I love her, and she has a Facebook page, and every so often she just straps her guitar on and her dog is jumping around in the kitchen and she's just singing songs that are mm -hmm. beautiful and yeah. and hopeful and I don't know I just you yeah. made me think of that when you were mentioning some of these other women so yeah. which is really I, I'm really loving uh, musicians and writers you know who are who are finding a way to connect with people right now I mean I think that you know um, I've definitely had some you know, hard days, um, as I know, and I'm really, really lucky, you know, I get, I, I can stay home. I'm not, I'm not out there saving lives. I'm not out there, you know, um, moving food into, you know, into, into, you know, grocery stores or getting it to people's homes. Um, so I'm incredibly lucky, you know, and, and even at that, I mean, I've had some really dark mornings, you know, and, and, and nights. And it's really meant a lot to me to be able to, to hear people playing music or reading from their books. Um, I've been reading a lot of poetry right now. I should probably have talked about poets I love. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, I, I think that um, we, you know, we have to take care of each other as best we can right now. And for me, having access to music has really meant a lot, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we can all find uh, is whatever heals us, you know, whatever tries or whatever makes the moment better, if not the day. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and I agree with you. I think music is healing and, and, and books are because they can take you away and they can educate you and they, they can, as your, what did you say? Your grandmother was the one that said, until they take you out in the box, there's always time. I like that. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah. you know, the characters in your book are, as so many people have said, unforgettable. They really do stay with you. So, um, you know, we just love having this time with you and, and we love the work that librarians are doing to get books out into the hands of people who are, you know, trying to, you know, go someplace right now, go someplace and, and read a book mm -hmm. and hear some music. And um, so this book, this book, is an such an important read it is so beautiful it is beloved by so many people and um we just thank you so much for writing it first of all <laughs> really putting your heart out there and boy did you ever because it is as everyone has told you 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 nailed it you nailed it with these women and um and gave you gave them a voice so thank you for doing that um, and I think unless Chris or Lainey there, you have questions or if there are any more questions or comments that um, need to be shared, I guess we'll probably just wrap it up. Anything else out there? Lots of love, lots of um, people who love the reading. They're like, keep going. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> get the book to listen. Uh, I mean, to read more. So um, be sure to check out the podcast episode because we, which is on that page that the link Chris shared, it's on the left-hand side. So because we talked about um, Bryn Chancellor, which has a, who did a great oh. quote for this book, which I didn't even get into, but. Um, we the author about, of Sycamore. 
Yes, right. a beautiful uh, book. If you're beautiful a, book, a beautiful, beautiful, deeply compassionate and well written, beautifully written, beautifully written book. So yeah. So um, we talk about uh, how she and you and your editor all have a connection. So go listen mm -hmm. to that and um, just we dive more into the characters and stuff. So it's very uh, it's more more supplemental information. So be sure to listen. And again, everything is right there on hc.com for, um, you know, for you to get the book, read more about it, all the, all the extras that we have there. Um, so Elizabeth, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. We were so looking forward to this and um, can't, just can't thank you enough for taking the time to, to spend with us and with librarians and uh, sharing Valentine with everyone. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. So it's been a pleasure to be here. And I hope wherever you are, you are safe and being good to yourselves. Um, I have a lot of girlfriends right now who are doing all of this with young children in the house. Um, my kid's 15. So he's amusing himself endlessly with, you know, YouTubes and books and whatever. But if you have young children in the house and you're doing this right now, my heart goes out to you in a very particular way. <laughs> so I hope that if you can carve out some time for yourself, you know, here and there, um, you're able to do so. So. Okay. Thanks y'all. Well, I think, and thank you. And thanks everyone for, for uh, listening in and uh, we'll be back on Thursday with another episode of door to door until then you take good care of yourselves. Be well and uh read valentine you will never forget it take Hi care bye, bye.